Hello, friends. I hope your 2022 is off to a creative and fulfilling start. Uh, to be honest, had a bit of a rough start to my own year. Um, I ended up pitching on and losing the Budweiser Clydesdale Super Bowl spot. Then two jobs in a row uh, in the UK that I pitched on and lost. And now it's a time in which there's a bit of a lull in the commercial space. Um, so I've been trying to use this time to clear off some old projects from the docket. Um, I've finished a few director's cuts from previous commercials, been editing my short film Honey, and uh, creating a course that I'm building to release alongside that film. And I've been having a ton of meetings about direction and goals for the next few years of my directing career. Uh, one of the things I've been working on is a deck that will serve as an introduction to a management company. Uh, one of my mentors is very generously introducing me to his team, and they wanted to hear a little bit about me, what I've worked on, what I have upcoming, what my goals for the future are, etc. Um, now, I'm not going to bore you with the ins and outs of that process of making that deck. Um, I don't even know what's going to come from it, if I'm totally honest. But as I've been in a bit of a reflective mood, looking back on past work and synthesizing an overarching direction, I have come across something that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, and that is I want to talk about finding your voice. Now, this is a very frequently discussed topic. People even sell workshops framed as a method for discovering your voice. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's that overly complicated a topic, but it is quite a mysterious one. Um, and it tends to be a little, you'll know it when you see it kind of thing. And that's a tough proposition for many filmmakers and photographers, uh, especially when they're just starting out. So I want to tell you a story about beginning to understand this process in my own career. When I was 22, I was an audio engineer working in recording studios in Nashville. I thought maybe I wanted to do music and I had an opportunity to intern at a studio. I fetched coffee, I soldered cables, I placed mics and otherwise paid my dues in the music industry. Well, I was also interested in photography. There's a ton of downtime in the studio and I made use of that time by photographing the bands as they went about the process of making the records. Um, I was slowly getting asked to do more and more photo projects and thought perhaps this might be another career avenue. I'd always been a fan of photojournalism. Even when I was a kid, I bought a Civil War photography book by Matthew Brady as a middle schooler. Uh, so I'd always kept up with conflict photographers and photojournalists. I found them to be quite compelling. Well, in 2001, a photo agency named Seven was started by a bunch of ex-Magnum photographers. The most famous among them was a photographer named James Noctway. And James is an incredible photographer. And if you haven't seen the documentary War Photographer, I cannot recommend it enough. They managed to mount a tiny camera on James's SLR as he photographs in active combat. It's completely insane. In fact, Seven, VII, actually had their first meeting in Lower Manhattan at James's apartment on September 10th, 2001. It went super late and tons, tons of these global conflict photographers ended up crashing in his apartment. So on the morning of September 11th, 2001, seven of the best conflict photographers from around the world happened to be blocks from the Trade Center. So many of the photographs that day that we come to recognize from that day were taken by these photographers. Anyway, Seven was starting to run workshops on developing a photo essay. And these were workshops that you had to apply to. And if you got in, they would take place somewhere around the world. Uh, Pakistan, Cambodia, Vietnam, Uganda. Um, so you would go for a few weeks and photograph a story as if you were on assignment from a magazine or a newspaper. Uh, they would help arrange local fixers, transportation, and then cut you loose to cover a story of your choosing, whatever you wanted to photograph in these places. Well, I applied to and got into a workshop that was taking place in Siem Reap, Cambodia, under the direction of Gary Knight. I freaked out. In fact, I had a small Nikon DSLR, but no lens. So I ended up buying a 20 mil lens, using it on the trip, and then returning it to the photo store when I got back because I didn't even have the money to rent one. Uh, this is me, by the way, uh, very young, very naive, very new to visual storytelling in any kind of structured way. <laughs> 
On the first couple of days of the workshop, we were given a list of suggested stories, things to get us going. Um, and I remember not really responding to any of them, to be honest, but I didn't really have anything better. So I went with a fixer and a driver out to an alligator farm to photograph. Honestly, I hated the images I got. They felt so forced and nothing was really happening either. And two of the other workshop attendees went as well. It just did not feel good. Um, I abandoned that pretty quickly and then just started wandering around, snapping a bunch of random photos during the day. Uh, it felt more interesting for sure, the serendipity of it all, but there wasn't really a story. Um, I started wandering at night and eventually started feeling like that's what I needed to do. So I got rid of my fixer, I got rid of my driver, and I would leave the hotel beginning at golden hour, photographing all night. I was just completely mesmerized by the bizarre nature of the nightlife and the people I met while wandering the streets of Siem Reap. Well, Gary was too. Of the photographs that I had brought him, he responded to the night imagery and suggested that I keep working in that direction, keep pushing it further. And so I did. And I ended up with a 15 image essay about the transition to night in Siem Reap. It was very lyrical, very abstract. And Gary said something to me though that set the direction for my entire career. One afternoon, he spread a huge mass of students' photographs across a big table. I mean, literally hundreds of photos. And he started pulling mine out of the mix. This one's yours, this one's yours, this one's yours. And he told me that he wasn't sure how I had arrived at this place at a young age, but that he could clearly see what I had made without seeing my name attached to it. He told me that this is the entire goal of a career in visual mediums. Can you make a thing that feels like you made it, even if your name isn't attached? He told me that I had to protect this vision. He went so far as to tell me that I really shouldn't go get a master's, which at the time is a traditional path in photojournalism, uh, and that I also shouldn't work for someone else, another traditional path in journalism, uh, you know, apprenticing under someone, but that I needed to figure out how to survive for half a decade. And by then my vision would have cemented and then no one could take it away from me. Um, I want to show you some of the photographs from this trip that Gary helped edit into an essay. To be honest, these images look like photographs that I would have taken yesterday, but it wasn't yesterday. It was well over a decade and a half ago. And he was absolutely right. There was a core approach that totally shone through. In fact, Gary then recommended that I look at the work of Robert Frank. He said that he saw a kindred spirit in my grainy, out of focus, lyrical, visual poetry. And so I went and bought a copy of The Americans. And honestly, it was another critical moment in my development as a visual storyteller. I mean, decades later, it still speaks to me, not just an image, but approach and willingness to put out work that runs in direct contrast to the dominant narrative of whatever time you live in. These images were made at the height of the Leave it to Beaver 1950s gloss. And yet, do these images look anything like that? Absolutely not. But Robert Frank couldn't do anything different if he tried. Now, all right, this would be an easy place to end the story, right? Young artist discovers his voice early in his career, but that's only half of this story. As I was digging through work to help create this deck, I stumbled on a folder of images that I made on that workshop trip in Cambodia that never made the cut. Images that I even showed to Gary and he immediately threw them in the trash can. He said, literally, these are bullshit and tell me nothing about who you are as an artist or the people you're photographing. In short, I shot a ton of work that was terrible, that wasn't in my voice. In the moment, I didn't know the difference between a crappy picture and something that spoke to a viewer. It took the guidance of a mentor to help coax out the work that was truly me to say, see this image here? You need to continue making work that feels like this. At least half of the process of developing your own voice will come from throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. What feels truthful? What feels like it has a sense of authorship? What is made when you ditch the alligator farm and the fixer and go wander around? 
All these find your voice mantras very often fail to recognize the very critical role mentors and peers play in helping us see the forest for the trees and find the pieces that if we were to spread them on a table would clearly carry your name, even if that name wasn't visible on the work. Anyways, that's my two cents as I work towards the next phase of my own career and executing at a larger scale with my embedded voice. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching and we'll catch you on another one soon enough.